Jeremiah 31 is where we are this morning. That's on the other side of that handout. Last week, if you recall, we divided chapter 31 into two parts. The first part we covered somewhat in depth, suggesting that the words here are prophetic on two different levels, two different fulfillments, more accurately. On the first fulfillment, it's very present. The people to whom Jeremiah is ministering are about to go into exile with the other people who are already in Babylon, and they're going to be there for a total of 70 years, and then they're going to come home. And that's what Jeremiah is telling the people in Jerusalem and the providence of Judah. You will come back, says the Lord. And when you come back, he's going to rebuild. He's going to plant. He's going to be with you in the coming back. When we looked at that, we realized that's also a prediction because of the blessings upon blessings upon blessings of the millennial reign of Jesus. And I was suggesting that this past week. You re-examine both the book of Revelation where it talks about the thousand-year reign of our Lord and this prophecy as if they actually meld together into one. Today we're going to examine part two. And that's God's promise of a new covenant to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And the question I want you to leave with, perhaps an answer, or at least motivation to examine your own research, is this the new covenant Jesus talked about when he established the Lord's Supper? When he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. So we're going to examine Jeremiah 31 with the goal that future we'll see if they are the same. So with your Bibles open, let's read a couple of verses from Jeremiah 31, at least 31 and 32. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So here is a promise by God to the Jews that he's going to make a new covenant with them. And it won't be like the old one. Well, those of you who study the Bible know there are several covenants in the Old Testament. There's the one that God made with Noah, that he would not destroy the world again by flood. There's the one that God made with Abraham, where he would make him a great nation. There's the covenant that God made with Moses at Mount Sinai, giving of the Ten Commandments. There's the covenant that the guys discussed Thursday from 2 Samuel that God made with David, that there would be a kingdom forever on which a descendant of his would rule and reign. Which of those covenants is this new one going to replace? Well, the hint is right there. Look down in your Bible. Not according to the covenant, verse 32, that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. Well, that seems to narrow all the covenants down to one, the Mosaic covenant, the one God made to Israel through Moses. If you will keep these Ten Commandments, I will bless you. If you break them, I will chastise you. I will correct you. It was a conditional covenant, unlike the one he made with Abraham that he would, for his generation and following generations, God promised a land, which is in dispute right now, even as we talk, right? That promise that God made to Abraham is being dis- disputed for centuries. Frankly, it won't be solved until Jesus comes back, but nonetheless... This covenant's not going to replace that one. Nor is it going to replace the one he made with Noah. Nor is it going to replace the one he made with David. This one replaces the Mosaic because he says so right here in the scriptures. 
not like the one that they broke. See, when God gave Moses the commandments, before he went even to get the commandments, they saw the smoke, they heard the thunder and the lightning, and they said to Moses, you go up there. Now I'm going to paraphrase. And whatever he says, we'll do. So he comes down with the tablets of stone. And what were they doing? Well, he's up there getting, they're breaking <laughs> those commandments. And you may think, well, how can they break commandments they haven't gotten yet? They already knew them. They already knew them. God just codified it, made it written on stone what he expected them to do when they came into the new land, and they broke it. Now, an excellent study for a home group or a personal study, why did God say, when I was like a husband to them, what's that all about? I'm not going to take the time to do that today because I want to keep going with what Jeremiah is asked by God to say regarding this new covenant. Those of you who study not just one book at a time, but the Bible as a whole, know that this covenant, these promises that God made, are unbreakable. God is not going to go back on his word. In fact, we've already covered Isaiah in this room where Isaiah is telling the people of Israel, God has made an everlasting covenant with you for this land. And when you go into exile and come back, he's going to honor that promise. That is unbreakable as far as he is concerned. Ezekiel says almost the same words. But what makes the book of Ezekiel fascinating to study he is a prophet saying, look, when you come back, God's going to keep and honor his promise for the land. However, there is coming a day when, and that's what makes his visions just, I wish we had time to go into that as a rabbit trail worth discussing. God has made many promises. The difference between his promises and his covenants and ours, he doesn't violate his. So when Jesus says to us, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. I'm going to come back. I'm going to take you where I am. John 14. That is a promise. He is going to do that. Now, I'm highlighting that passage because it fits the promises of God Almighty and his son Jesus the Christ our King and it will also play into our next First Friday study when we talk about the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25 why is the groom delayed it fits into that verse this new covenant has some major differences that I want to go through and take a look at here. One, it is to replace the old. To verify that, just read what Paul wrote to the churches over and over again, especially in the book of Romans, but many others. This new covenant replaces the old. No one was intended to be saved by keeping the law, period. Paul makes that clear. The purpose of the law wasn't salvation. The purpose was the law to lead you to Messiah. The purpose of the law was to tell you, convince you, like a mirror, you're a sinner and you need Jesus. That was what the law was all about. Unfortunately, even people today think I need to keep the Ten Commandments so God will let me into heaven. And if I don't, verse 33. i got to get my mind focused on this. But this is the covenant. Please look at your own Bible. 
that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What was the old covenant written on? Stone. The new covenant is written on the hearts and minds of the believers, the followers. That's a huge difference. And you will keep them. Jesus confirmed this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now let me restate that with a little different sound. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, what if I said it like this? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Which is true? Both, one, or the other? What's the greatest commandment? Love God. How? With all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And others as yourself. And in keeping these, you keep all the commandments, says our Lord. So God is saying there's coming a day when I'm going to write my law on your hearts and in your minds. And you will keep it because I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now I want you to look at that verse again. And if you don't mind circling a verse in your Bible, circle these three. They line up per perfectly with the New Testament as well. John talks about a day that was going to come when nobody would need to teach you anymore. Then why have Sunday school? Why have Bible studies? Why go to school? If God and Jesus are promising, nobody needs to teach you. Why do any of that? Is that what he's saying? Not at all. What he's saying is, I'm going to write it on your heart. I'm going to put it in your mind. Jesus comes along and says, Father said he's going to write it on your heart and mind. I'm saying, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And he will teach you. He will guide you. He will lead you and comfort you and stand beside you. And he will interpret your prayers to the Father when all you can do is moan and groan and the words won't come. Now that is a helpmate. That's what he's talking about. That day has come. Every born-again believer has the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within them to help them and guide them. So if you will take the time to read and study the Bible, the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you through the Scriptures. What is helpful to both you and the person you're meeting with is when you share those insights and you bounce these ideas off of each other. I'll give you an example. Some men enjoy coming to Thursday night where we have almost a round table type discussion about the scriptures. We had one again on the seventh chapter of Second Samuel regarding the covenant God made with David. Was it forever or was it permanently? That took 10 or 15 minutes. To discussing different translations and versions and different words that Bible scholars use to interpret the same Hebrew word. Some men don't like that at all. They don't come. They'd rather one person say, this is what it means, believe this, go home. 
Those of you who went to college, was your professor exactly like that? Yeah. This is the way it is. Believe it or get an F. I may remember at Fresno University, my first day at the economics class, walked into this auditorium, and there must have been a hundred and some students in there, and here's this freshman not knowing. I was a tadpole in a really big pond. He looks up over the crowd and says, next week there'll be a quiz, I'm going to get rid of half of you. And he did. He wasn't going to mess around with 150 students. I learned another lesson. Once the college has cashed your tuition check, they don't care. Go to class, don't go to class. Flunk, flunk. Get an F, get an F. Get an A, eh, we don't care. We got your money. They don't care which is why a lot of parents are beginning to homeschool their children. <laughs> Schools don't seem to care anymore. There I'm on another tangent. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is God has relayed to us as moms and dads and care, uh, grandparents the duty of instructing our children to living the life by example. They can see what it means to know God. Look back down in your Bible. I... Know the Lord. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. What you know is truth. There is a huge difference between knowing God and knowing about God. The reason we study Scripture so diligently in this little fellowship is that difference. We want you to know God and about him because we have found from personal experience over the decades that the more you know about God, the more you love him and want to serve him and obey him and live the life he's called you to live. In your life, you're approaching those days, you may be living in them now, when people don't need to tell you that again. You got it. That doesn't mean every day goes perfectly, but it means, okay, I got it. I'll give you an example. You have a day like I have in my garage or on Highway 89. You know the day I'm talking about? How quickly does it take God to forgive you of those days? What should that compel you or want you to do next time you get on Highway 99 to do better. One of these days it will work. I was just confessing to one of the guys today in the fellowship there before church started, I go into my garage to find a tool and I can't find it. And this cranky old man immediately thinks somebody borrowed my tool and didn't put it back where it belongs. And that's why I can't find it. Marsha! <laughs> Who was the guy that didn't put the hammer back where it belonged? <laughs> when will I learn? I'm belaboring this point because of verse 34 is reiterated again and again in the New Testament. We want, we need teachers. I didn't put all these references, I don't think, in your notes, but in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, one of the gifts Jesus gives the church are teachers. Well, if it's true that nobody needs to be taught anymore, why does Jesus put teachers in the church? This is why from this box, we're always asking for volunteers to go next door to teach the youngsters, the children in Sunday school. God knows who the teachers are. I don't. So I just keep giving the invitation. When God says to you, you need to go over there and teach, go and find some peace. And 
what it's like to teach youngsters, especially after they've had a half a dozen donuts. Then why did Jesus send the Holy Spirit to teach, John 14? Why did John write in his first letter, quote, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, abide in him. You see how John cleverly wrote that? You don't need for anybody to teach you, but the spirit in you will teach you. And that needs to be shared with other people by your actions and your teaching. Now, some of the differences between this new covenant and the old one include this. Under the old covenant, sins were atoned. That is, the blood of the sacrifice covered the sin for another year especially on the Day of Atonement for the nation of Israel. Atone means covered. So the, the blood of the sacrifice covered the, the sins of the sinner as he, she laid her, his hands on the head of the goat and gave it to the priest to be sacrificed. Sins were transferred to the animal on his behalf. We don't do that anymore because of Jesus. He's the lamb who took away the sins. That's a new covenant difference. We're not obliged anymore to go find a perfect sacrifice, take it to a priest, and have it offered on our behalf. Jesus already did that. Number two, their sins were just pushed ahead. They were never completely eradicated. Jesus did that by his sacrifice on the cross. He fulfilled this promise. Again, look at verse 34. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Does yours read like that? Do you notice what it doesn't say? The Bible does not say, and I will forget your sin. I've heard so many people say, well, you know, God promised to forget our sin. No, he didn't. In my mind, there is a huge difference from forgetting something and remembering it no more. One has to do with my concept of who God is. God knows everything. God cannot not know. God cannot forget the sin that I've been forgiven. What about remembering? That means he's not going to bring it up to me anymore. When I feel guilty for something I've done, again, that's me. That's not the Lord saying, ah, ah, ah. You know, one more of those and... <laughs> that's me. That's not him. He won't bring it up. A little marital advice. Once you have forgiven your spouse of something, remember it no more. You know what's going to have to happen? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to do that. Why am I going down these rabbit trails? Back to verse 38. Excuse me, verse 35, chapter 31. I want you to notice the oath that God uses on this new covenant. Verse 35, thus says the Lord. You see that? Verse 37, thus says the Lord. He is telling us the foundation, the basis of this promise. One, it is his word. He is saying so. Jeremiah is the voice they're listening to. God is the speaker. Thus says the Lord. Now look at verse 35. 
Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. Who's making this promise? Creator God. Yahweh is his name. The Lord of hosts, the captain over the whole army of angels is his name. That's who's saying, I'm going to make a new covenant. Verse 36, part of the promise. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So what is he saying? God is saying, if I don't keep my word, Israel will disappear. That's how sure this is. Verse 37, thus says the Lord. He's swearing by his own name. If heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Now, I don't know much about outer space, but what little I know is you can't measure it. It is so vast, we measure it in light years. If I remember correctly, a light year is how far light can travel in one year. And 186,000 miles per second, that's quite a distance. Wouldn't you agree? So if something is 35 light years away, it is not next door. <laughs> except in space. Well, yeah, we're just going to go over there and get a hamburger at Burger King next door. 35 million light years from where we are. Okay. Why did I do that? To show you that most people's concept of God is just too tiny. God is saying, if you learn how to measure space, then your descendants will disappear. Now, he's talking to the Jewish people. But I think he's telling us, if I make a promise, it's for sure. And it's not going to be based on what man can or cannot do. It's based on who I am. I am the Lord of hosts. I am Yahweh, your God. And I say, I'm going to make a new covenant. Now, I think this is a future new covenant covenant because the very first phrase is behold the days are coming verse 31 that's why I personally think in my studies thus far that God in Jeremiah's day is looking forward to what Jesus is going to do when he established the new covenant that's what I'm thinking it is so I think Jesus when he came is saying this is the new covenant remember that one that God promised you through Jeremiah here it is here it is right now. It's in my blood. It's in redemption. I'm not going to cover your sins. I'm going to forgive them. Father God said so. But God isn't done yet. Verse 38. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord, from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The surveyor's line shall again extend straight forward over the hill of Gerub. Then it shall turn toward Goath, period. Behold, the days are coming. How far in the future of Israel will the city, and now I'm assuming that's Jerusalem, will be rebuilt for the Lord, mine's all caps, Yahweh, from the Tower of Phanel to the corner gate. Now those two places are in Scripture. We can identify those. They're on opposite corners of the city. 
which encompasses a bigger distance than Jerusalem in the days of Jeremiah. So this new Jerusalem is going to be bigger than the old one. Now what we don't know, because this is the only place Gareb and Goath appear, we don't know what those landmarks are. But what we can assume, I think, very accurately is they did. And God is telling the Jews of Jeremiah's day, when I rebuild the city, it's going to be bigger than you ever imagined it could be. It's going to go from over there to over there. Then you read the Revelation of John. How big is this city? (laughs) It is humongous. When you transfer the measurements in the book of Revelation to our standard measurements, it's measured in miles, not yards or feet. 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Now that is one big city. Now I don't know where your penthouse is going to be. Mine's going to be just outside the gate. Because my job is to sweep those golden streets. But God is saying to the people, this is going to happen because I say so. And if you think you enjoy a beautiful city now, wait till I build the new one. Now he doesn't use new one, but he's giving us an indication by describing a city that is much larger than the one they've ever known. Certainly bigger than the one that David captured and built the city of David just below. The surveyor's line again will extend forward over the hill of Gareb. Then it shall turn towards Goat. I wish those two places were in the Bible so I could expand this. But they're not. Verse 39, 40, excuse me. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and the fields as far as Brook Kidron to the corner of the horse gate towards the east shall be holy to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or thrown down anymore forever. So God is describing a town when the valley below Jerusalem will be covered with corpse and ashes of burning weapons. Now, if you go to Ezekiel, you go, oh, maybe that's that, perhaps. But look at the last sentence. It shall not be plucked up or thrown down. It will not be destroyed by anyone forever. It will be permanent. It will be here. And this is where the discussion we had Thursday comes in. How long is forever that God is talking about here? Is that for as long as the earth shall exist? Or is that into eternity? Good question, isn't it? How long is forever in the mind of God who's outside of time and space? If a day's like a thousand years and a thousand years to a day, how long is forever? How long is it to God who has no beginning and has no end? So if God says to your prayer request, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Now, is that Monday or is that a thousand years from Monday? (laughs) See, these are all questions that come up in the minds of serious students of Scripture. What does God mean by forever? This is a valley of which he is speaking, correct? Correct. So could forever mean until this planet is destroyed and all the elements that makes it melted? 
Could that be when that ends? If so, then when does his promise of a new Jerusalem, I mean, the old Jerusalem, I mean, what is all of this? This is why it's imperative upon us to be students of Scripture, to read it, to understand it, to be able to ask and answer real questions, to rightly divide the Scriptures. This is why we do what we do here on a regular basis. This is why on the first Friday in February, I'd like to have another go at the parables. Only this time it's going to be less of a discussion and more of a presentation about the ten virgins and how to interpret them. Who are they? What are, what are the lamps? What's the oil? Who's the bridegroom? Why is he delayed? And then move over to the one that's a little bit more difficult, the parable of the talents, where the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who comes back and gives goods to his servants, some five some two, some one. What's that all about? If the kingdom of heaven is like that, we need to understand that because we're in the kingdom of heaven. God is saying there's coming a day when I'm going to do this. I'm going to build a new Jerusalem for you Jews because this one is going to be destroyed while you're gone. And he does. He sends prophets and workers back the Babylonian king is going to help them in, in a way with goods and money and they're going to rebuild. But God is saying, there's coming a day when I'm going to build this city bigger than what you're going to build. And the temple I'm going to build is grander than the one you've got in mind. If you don't think so, go back and look at the, new, the temple that Ezekiel describes in his prophetic words and compare that to any temple that has ever existed. And you're thinking, how big is this thing? huge you have it on authority thank you see that's what happens when you look at the bible over and over again i think it's quite possible that this new covenant god promises through jeremiah is the one jesus talks about and here's my reasoning that i would like you to verify for yourself number one Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant which is set, shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26, 28. And in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, God says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete is growing old, is ready to vanish away. For this reason... He is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant and that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Combination of Hebrews 8.13 and Hebrews 9.15. Romans 11.27 For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins wrote Paul about the Jews. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6, who also made us sufficient ministers of the new covenant, who also made you sufficient ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. I think that fits Jeremiah 31. And you have been enlisted into God's kingdom as ambassadors to do this very thing. So I'd like to do for you what I think you're going to do for somebody else when you explain this to them. You have two possible responses to all of this. You ignore it. Not a big deal. What's that got to do with me? I'm a 21st century guy. Or you can embrace it. This has everything to do with me. Because I believe in God. 
and I want to know him. I want to know that he knows who I am. Because I don't want to hear, and I don't want you to hear, depart from me, because I don't know you. I want you to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in.